Welcome to our fifth summer series webinar hosted by the SARID Lands Landscape Board. My name is Paul Wordley and I'm the Regional Agricultural Land Care Facilitator for the Board. This webinar series is supported by the Board through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. As a result of the cancellation of our field day for 2020, we have had the opportunity to make use of the wealth of knowledge from our range of speakers who would have featured at the event. So far, we have had Bruce Maynard talk on boosting your bottom line, Deb Scammell talk on containment feeding, Michelle Cousins describe new pastoral technology, and Penny Keynes present on livestock biosecurity. We still have two webinars to go in this series after this one. The first one is by Farm Map 4D, and the second, Professor Wayne Pitchford will be discussing dark cuttings. We are recording these webinars, providing a resource for those on, who are unable to attend, and we will add them to the SA Atlantis YouTube playlist with the link available on our website, or if you send me an email, I can reply to the link. Before I introduce Colin, I'll quickly go through some technical, technical issues we get with Teams. Most of you guys would know this already, but if the screen freezes or the sound starts cutting out, give it a few seconds. Sometimes Teams just needs a moment to catch up. If the problem does persist, let me know and I'll do my best to solve it. Tomorrow, I'll send out an email with a link to a survey to all those who registered or whose names I recognise. It's only six questions, mostly multi-choice. Your feedback is important and provides an opportunity to suggest future webinars. For this summer series webinar, we have Colin Tregrove presenting on sheep survival in the S. Arid Lands. Colin is a lecturer in ruminant health and production at the School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences at the University of Adelaide. He's a career interest in ruminant nutrition and health, which spans, which spans employment in primary industries, mixed veterinary practice, livestock consultancy, and academia, all in South Australia. His first job was based here in Port Augusta in 1980 to 81, focusing on brucellosis and TB eradication above the dog fence. Colin's research interests include the interaction between macro and trace element nutrition, grazing management and water quality on animal health and production. Colin is happy to answer your queries throughout the talk if you need clarification. There should be an icon on the screen that allows you to put your hand up. Or if you choose to wait, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. Please don't hesitate to type the questions in the chat box as you think of them. And between me and Colin, we'll make sure they get answered. Now, if we are ready to go, I would like to introduce Colin Trengrove to talk on sheep survival in the Sarah lands. Okay, thank you, Paul, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, and as uh, Paul has said, um, I'll welcome questions as we go along. Otherwise, I anticipate it's a, probably about a 40 minutes uh, presentation. But I appreciate there's some complex um, nutritional issues uh, involved in the uh, presentation. So if you've got any points of clarification, by all means, uh, ask the questions. Uh, and so, yeah, thank you to SA Aridlands for the opportunity to speak. Uh, disappointed that we didn't get to the field day, but um, uh, this is not a bad alternative. Okay, so the topics to cover, sheep nutrition and benchmarks for pregnancy, lactation and growth, uh, animal husbandry, health and welfare, grazing management strategies uh, and monitoring tools. Now, not necessarily in that order, but they will certainly cover those issues as we go along. So now I appreciate that some of the material I present is not necessarily directed towards the, um, the pastoral country necessarily, but I think some of these issues is a, to highlight that um, you need to be looking at benchmarks and perhaps you need to work out your own for your own environment. But uh, these uh, key performance indicators uh, and profitability are really related more to um, the agricultural parts of the state. Uh, and I appreciate that there's some considerable variation to what we might um, anticipate in the northern region or the, or the pastoral country in South Australia, or for that matter, any pastoral areas in the country. Um, so, for example, here we talk about a year ram ratio of about, in fact, one ram, if they're fertile, they should animate 75 ewes in a, in a five to six week joining period without any trouble. Uh, and that's basically a one and a half percent. Now, a lot of people use two, two and a half percent. That might to do with the terrain. It might be to do with the fact that they haven't necessarily done a vet check on the rams to know that they are totally fertile. Uh, and so I appreciate there are, there's going to be variations from that. But ideally, we always recommend that all rams uh, should be checked uh, for health and fertility prior to use. Uh, we can look at uh, scanning percentage. Now, once again, I appreciate scanning is not a common practice in the in the pastoral areas, but uh, it is a very useful tool. So at least then you know you can ex know what to expect in terms of lambing outcomes. 
even if you don't achieve them. We would like to think that um, with a five or six week joining that you'll actually have less than 2% use empty. In other words, they should by and large be all mated in a, in a two breeding cycles. In other words, two lots of a 17 day cycle. Uh, we can also look at the lambs born alive for 100 ewes joined, which is really the true lambing percentage. And then lambs marked for 100 ewes joined, which is the true marking percentage. Uh, ewe mortality, we would target less than 4%. So all being well, um, if the ewes are in, in good condition at, uh, through lambing and at lambing, uh, there should be a very low mortality rate. And then lambs lost between scanning, which we normally do at around about mid-pregnancy, so around about day 80, uh, would, when we normally recommend scanning. Uh, so that last um, 70 days from day 80 to day 150, we would expect less than 15% loss. Now that can be uh, embryo loss, it may be loss uh, in the latter part of pregnancy, uh, but it is normal to lose some lambs between scanning and weaning anyway. Uh, and the last point here that lamb marking uh, and weaning weights uh, and other periods that we actually use as a performance indicator. Okay, so that's really just saying that, okay, we should be monitoring these things, uh, but the, the actual indicators may vary from uh, region to region. So what are we focused on? So really the U is the, uh, the engine room of the enterprise. Uh, sure, the uh, rams are necessary to spread the gen genetics about, and hopefully improve the genetic profile of the flock. But from a, a U point of view, we are really focused on, you know, what, uh, how many U's can you run per square kilometre, for example. The stocking rate really drives profitability. And of course, uh, we want to look at um, what, what's their fleece weight, what's their fibre diameter, what is their reproduction, as we've just referred to, and then monitoring for some other issues that might be, um, you know, if you've had a significant rainfall, um, worms can become an issue even in pastoral areas. Uh, and the last one there is ewe mortality as we've already addressed. And from a progeny perspective, obviously um, how we manage the ewe is to how the progeny perform in terms of fleece weight, fibre diameter, survival, growth, composition, uh, and once again, worms and reproduction. Whoop, get out of that glitch hopefully, right. So if we were going into a drought situation, we need to be considering you know, what we need to sell. Obviously, hopefully we're coming out of that in most situations, although I appreciate some people haven't been as fortunate as others getting rain in the last 12 months. But so we, uh, when we're deciding to sell, we're looking at you know, culling off the oldest uh, and weathers, although not many people keep weathers anymore, uh, then culling the hoggets, then the um, use with faulty issues second oldest age group and then we get down obviously we want to retain a core breeding stock as best we can but I appreciate in some circumstances that hasn't even been achieved um, in the last three years uh, but anyway enough about some um, strategic management of dry times really want to focus on what we can do with what we've got so meeting the nutritional needs of the ewe now this stylized diagram is really highlighting the fact that um, when you're in the green period whenever that may be uh, you can have quite high digestibility regardless of the plant species. So whether it's uh, forbs, uh, shrubs, perennials or native annual grasses, uh, the digestibility can be quite high, up around 75%, which um, we can talk about percentage terms or it directly mathematically relates to megajoules uh, or calories is the old term. But these days we talk megajoules and so when you're up around about 10 to 11 megajoules, uh, we know that it's a, it's a high quality feed. But um, as plants uh, mature uh, and then senesce or die, uh, the quality of the feed deteriorates accordingly. So we get down here around about 60% digestibility, um, which is around about eight and a half uh, megajoules. So that's about the cutoff about what is supports um, a dry sheep. And below that, um, you really need to have either a, a good variety or mix, mixture in the feed on offer, or otherwise you need to provide uh, some alternative source to um, support the animal. But we'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. So I'll refer now to um, uh, Outback Report, uh, published in 2013, done by San Jolly um, with the Outback Lakes group, where the pastoralists nominated what plant species they considered were uh, of high value 
or the best feed value. So we have, um, unfortunately, on the graph I'm about to show, it's all the uh, Latin names, for example, uh, Acacia victoriae, which is uh, the prickly wattle, or the uh, ATXXX uh, viscaria, the bladder salt bush, and so we go on. So unfortunately, there's a, yeah, there's a bit of interpretation required here, but um, so these are the plants were generally recognised as being more palatable and more highly sought after by grazing stock. So now if we look at those uh, particular plants uh, in a graphical form from the analysis during the project back in uh, 2000, actually, well, actually the project was in two parts, it was about 2005 and six, and then again from 2010 to 2013. And if you actually want to copy the report, uh, I'm sure uh, Paul can source that and send it through to you. So here, first up, if we just look at the, uh, the energy value of some of the pastoral species, uh, and we see here that um, we have metabolizable energy uh, values up around uh, up to 10 to 11. And, uh, and of course, um, I guess the lowest one here is at six megajoules. Uh, and we'd normally say that an adult dry sheep needs around about eight megajoules a day. And so if an animal can eat one kilogram of dry matter, uh, it will be eating, most of these species can provide eight megajoules. Uh, and of course, some of these actually um, are much better than that. So, um, for example, the uh, what have we got here? So the um, ver verbene, uh, which is the um, C. australis, <laughs> get that right in a minute, australasicum. Um, so we see that's providing uh, well over 10 megajoules, probably 11 megajoules, and uh, we also have the. Uh, Trigonella suavissima, which is the um, sweet clover or native clover, which is uh, also quite highly high energy content. Uh, and then these others taper off. But it just highlights that these plant species uh, can certainly provide adequate energy to meet the needs of both um, a pregnant lact a growth, uh, sorry, pregnant and a lactating ewe, whereas some of these others uh, it does taper off. Similarly, the most, second most important nutrient to supply is crude protein. And we see here that um, if we say a dry sheep needs about 8% crude protein in the diet, we can see here that these plants are quite capable of providing you know, well up into the 20% crude protein. And even a young lamb uh, at birth requires around about 16% crude protein. So um, some of these plants are quite, you know, quite high protein content and so quite suitable for meeting the needs of you in, in lactation. So we'll just touch on that a bit more as we go along. Uh, so what can you do about improving uh, sheep reproductive performance? So as a manager of sheep, you can increase the conception rate by feeding your ewes better, especially pre-joining, so they're in, in good condition at joining to get the best ovulation rate. Uh, you can improve the genetics by buying uh, better merino, uh, should I say better rams, be it merino or um, uh, dorper or demra. Uh, you can also look at um, doing a fertility check on your rams. So we talk about doing the 4T test. So the 4T is uh, checking their teeth, make sure they've got a sound mouth so they can actually graze and put on condition adequately. Uh, we can look at their toes. When we talk about toes, we're really referring to their general um, stature and, lay and no evidence of lameness. So um, we want to make sure that these rams, be obviously are going to be working hard during the uh, joining period, so they need to be structurally sound uh, without any lameness and so if there's any evidence of foot abscess or other issues they need to be sorted well before the ram is due to be used. In fact we normally say the ram check should be done uh, at least two months prior to joining because that gives you time to um, either find replacement rams or get the current rams up to scratch. So we've covered off to teeth and toes, uh, now we talk about testes. So we normally refer to a ram in a generic sense. It's actually um, two semen canisters with a delivery system because effectively when you're buying a ram, you're buying the genetic potential. So it's what's in the semen. So when we're looking at the uh, two semen canisters, in other words, the two testicles, we'd like to think they're going to be around about the size of two beer cans because if they're, they're that size, two beer cans, that's worth about um, a kilogram of semen. And so that's where one ram, if he's fertile, should be able to serve at least 75 to even 100 ewes in a six-week joining period. And uh, if those two semen canisters are full, uh, they should 
feel if you're feeling the um the tone of the testicles they should feel like a flexed muscle in other words quite firm and tight and uh, that's telling you that they're full of semen the other critical thing is that we've got to make sure that um, the delivery system is able to provide the um the goods and so we don't want to have lumps and bumps in the um, epididymis which is the uh, the pole and the base of the epi of the testicle is the little epididymis where the semen is stored before it's delivered so we actually feel that during a ram exam and if they feel hard like a knuckle or a um, marble uh, we know that that ram, ram's got a problem if they're feeling soft and fluctuant similar to the tone of the testicle um, they should be okay and then of course we want to make sure that the um, the penis hasn't been damaged uh, during shearing, had the end chopped off or some injury like that or something more disastrous. So the uh, fourth T is actually the um, tossle or the tackle. Uh, and so we've got teeth, toes, testes and tossle. So we're really looking at um, just checking out the penis and the prep use to make sure they don't have any infections or, or injuries. So if you've done all that, the ram should be good. Next thing is increasing lamb survival. So we're looking at maintaining new condition during pregnancy because that uh, is critical to the survival uh, of the ewe um, the and, and the potential progeny. Plus, it also impacts the lifetime uh, uh, wool production of the progeny. So, for example, if the uh, ewes are underfed during pregnancy, the uh, progeny will have um, less follicles per square centimetre, and so they'll be lifelong have a lifelong reduction in the amount of wool produced. Uh, we can monitor you uh, nutrition by doing uh, condition scoring and assessing how much feeds in the paddock. So we talk a bit more about that as we go along. Uh, and of course, another tool is pregnancy scanning if that is an option available to you. The last point here is increasing weaner survival. So if we're looking to produce um, replacement ewes, for example, say they are around about 25 to 30 kilos at weaning you don't have to feed them a lot they just need to be gaining a little bit of weight each month to encourage good survival if they're not gaining weight after weaning well that's a surefire way to um to have them die on you and so uh, this illustration here is just um a lifetime new management school where we're learning to do uh, condition scoring and uh and then do that through it and i would I'll talk a bit later about when that's best done. And then we can also look at the feed on offer. In other words, how much and what variety of feed is on offer to encourage um, good nutrition for the ewe. So confinement feeding, if that's an option too, well and good. Um, so Deb Scammell has obviously talked to you about that, so I won't talk any more about it, other than to say, I mean, there are some quite good confinement systems around these days. A lot of producers have got into confinement feeding because that's um, a big advantage is it reduces the energy needs of the um, sheep by 20% because they're not roaming around the paddock. Uh, you can provide a, an easy source of water of satisfactory quality. Uh, and of course, um, if you've got access to hay or grain, uh, it's, a, it's a, a very good way to go and it preserves your um, pasture species uh, if um, times are tough. Okay, so moving on from that, uh, just a point here that um, and the little uh, denotation here in the top corner is uh, sheep lost from milk fever costs around about $11 million annually in Australia. Uh, and one of the reasons for milk fever is if you've been feeding them on a significant grain diet uh, or just poor quality feed for too long, they can often be lacking in calcium, uh, which is called uh, results in milk fever, especially in the latest, last six weeks of pregnancy. Uh, and so, and especially older ewes. So ewes older than four years of age, uh, just like humans older than 50 years of age, uh, have a reduced ability to both uh, uptake calcium and also retain it in the system. And so as um, sheep and people and other animals get older, they're more prone to calcium deficiency because they're less able to retain it. And, uh, and so that can be an issue. So you often may need to do um, calcium supplementation as a general rule, calcium is um, uh, not limiting in the pastoral soils, pastoral country, but um, it can be if you're substituting that feed with grain, for example. Uh, and so what, how do animals appear? Well, as the illustration here, they're dull and depressed, uh, tend to be able to, unable to stand, inappetent, and eventually die after a few days uh, from basic starvation. And uh, it can be treated by giving them oral supplements, but of course you've got to have them on hand. 
uh, or it can be prevented by providing salt licks with a bit of calcium and ideally magnesium added in in the last uh, couple of months of pregnancy. But ideally, don't stress use in the last four weeks of pregnancy. So don't get yarn them for any particular reason because that's often the reason that puts them over the edge. Okay, so some uh, rules of thumb we talk about when we're doing feed budgets. So uh, I probably have these in the wrong order, I should say. First of all, one dry sheep equivalent is the definition is a 50 kilogram dry sheep at maintenance requirements and they need about eight megajoules a day. In fact, that's quite similar to what we, if you're an 80 kilogram adult or thereabouts, um, we need about 8.7 megajoules a day. So a 50 kilogram sheep uh, needs about the same as what we do. And uh, we normally would say a dry sheep equivalent will eat about a kilogram of dry matter a day. Now we talk about dry matter because it's always easy to compare apples with oranges if you always talk about in a dry state. In other words, when it's 100% dry matter, uh, if it's um, so, what we do when we test feed, we always dry it back to a 100% dry matter state, and then we can talk about the energy and protein requirements in a dry feed or dry matter, uh, and compare them between different um, plant species. But when we say an animal will eat about one kilogram of dry matter a day, um, for example, if that is actually um, green, lush green feed, it might be 80% moisture. So it's actually going to need five times. It's going to need five kilograms of green feed to give you one kilogram of dry matter. But anyway, don't get hung up too much about that. This is also allowing for the fact that you will always get a bit of wastage uh, with whatever they're eating. Uh, whereas um, if it is actually dead feed, um, an animal will, will need to eat about 1.5 kilos a day to meet their daily requirements. Because normally a one kilogram of dry matter which is actually a green feed, uh, will actually have at least eight megajoules in it, whereas um, dead dry feed may only have about um, five, four or five megajoules in it, and so they will need to eat half as much again to get their daily needs. The other little rule of thumb here is that adult sheep will normally eat about 2% of their body weight a day. So if it's a 60 kilogram sheep, 2% of body weight is 1.2 kilograms. Now, if it's an 80 kilogram sheep, well, 2% is um, 1.6 kilograms. So you can actually have a rough idea of how much feed an animal will eat each day just based on this uh, rule of thumb, which I'll also come back to. Okay, so we're talking about a dry sheep, dry sheep equivalent, which is a 50 kilogram ewe. The energy demand is about eight megajoules a day. Uh, and then if we uh, go along a bit further as they get into late or late pregnancy and to lambing, the energy, energy requirements goes up 50%. So it goes from eight megajoules a day up to about 12. And then we move into lactation. And we see here that if they've got a single lamb, their energy requirements will go up two and a half times. So instead of being uh, down here at eight, they'll be needing almost 20 megajoules a day. And then if they've got twins, they'll need um, three and a half times. In other words, up around about um, 30 megajoules a day. Now this, uh, they reach peak lactation about three weeks after lambing. So that's this period here. Uh, and then after that, their energy or their milk requirements taper off. And of course, it coincides with the lamb or lambs then eating green feed. So by the time the lamb is about six weeks old, they've been eating enough green feed, six to eight weeks old to, uh, for their rumen to be fully functional. And so they can actually be weaned at eight weeks of age, but um, you know, that's uh, pretty harsh on them. We normally say don't wean them until about 12 to 14 weeks, uh, ideally. So that gives you some idea of the energy requirements of a, a ewe during late pregnancy lactation. And then if we look at what's the value of the feed in a paddock. So we normally talk about, you know, in the ideal world, you have an autumn break and so you have a green feed emerge uh, whether it's um, annuals or forbs or perennials, uh, species, shrubs, etc. Uh, and so the energy value in the paddock or the energy available to the animal actually increases quite dramatically. Now that that might coincide with any significant rainfall, you know, whether you have um, 20 or 30 or 50 mil in, uh, and away she goes. So the energy in the paddock obviously is a product of what's the value, feed value of the feed in the paddock, but also the appetite of the animal. And so the appetite will go up with the quality of the feed. So better quality feed, they can eat more. Uh, the other principle is that um, 
as they lamb, it creates more space in the gut so they can eat more. So their appetite goes up, driven also by the need to produce milk. So on the hand, one hand, we've talked about what's the energy requirements of the sheep. Now we've just talked about the energy available in the paddock, depending on seasonal conditions. Uh, and now we marry them together. So for example, say um, uh, you have an April lambing. So we know that the energy requirements are going to go up uh, and then peak at lactation and taper off. And say um, this might be the um, energy availability in the paddock. So we see here there's a huge gap between what the ewe needs uh, and what's available on offer in the paddock. And uh, so there we need, ideally, if you're going to get the ewe and lambs or lambs to survive, you'll need a lot of supplements. Uh, or otherwise you're going to get significant weight loss, um, lamb deaths and um, you know, less milk produced. And the consequences is pregnancy toxemia. So pregnancy toxemia, uh, is probably the number one killer of ewes, uh, apart from enterotoxemia. But pregnancy toxemia is actually uh, an energy deficit in the last six weeks of pregnancy. So it's really just a glucose deficiency uh, or controlled starvation in a way because they haven't been getting enough energy to meet their needs during the latter stages of um, pregnancy, especially associated with uh, multiple lambing, so twins or triplets. And so this is a scenario where... Um, just on the point of lamb and the ewe sort of collapsed and died and she's got twins or in this case it was a fair triplets, same story. Um, the ewe had been stressed, it had actually been trucked to market, would you believe, and it had um, unborn triplets and so on. So the signs, once again, a bit like milk fever, dull and depressed, recumbent, not able to eat and they die after one to three days. Uh, and you'll normally find you open up the body, there's no fat inside and the uh, liver is quite an ochre colour. Uh, because it's been digesting a lot of fat um, until the fat reserves run out. Once again, huge cost to the industry, estimated at $16 million a year. So treatment, if, if they are still in the early stages, looking a bit dull and depressed but standing, you can actually give them propylene glycol or glucose, long-acting glucose treatments. But, um, yeah, you need to give them twice daily for anything up to a week to have any chance of survival. Uh, but the prevention is maintaining use and at least score 2.5 out of 5 or better. Um, by scanning use, you can pick which ones have got twins and give them better tucker. Uh, and once again, don't stress them in the last four weeks of pregnancy. That's probably, an, I won't talk about any other diseases, but I probably should have, should mention enterotoxin. It can obviously kill sheep at any stage, pregnant or otherwise, uh, which I can talk about if you'd like me to. Okay. So this is just a jumping forward. If we said, um, say you've got um, a good green feed around about, you have had perhaps rain after the autumn break. So the energy requirements for the June lambing goes up typically, but the energy requirements and appetite with the ewe are more closely associated with the energy requirements. So what's in the paddock and what the animal needs is pretty closely matched. So you may get away with no supplements or you may need some supplements but that's really what we're aiming to do. Ideally, you're matching the energy needs of the ewe and lamb with the, what's on offer in the paddock. Now, you can manipulate that by your grazing management strategies, uh, or it may also be obviously associated with when um, feed conditions are ripe. So it's going to depend very much on your local regional circumstance. But um, by strategic movement with grazing management, Ideally, what you're aiming to do is provide the best feed on offer and the most palatable species when the animals need it most. In other words, around about lambing time and onwards. But uh, we certainly need to keep the ewes in good condition through throughout pregnancy. Okay, so what do animals need? So this is out of um, the National um, Ruminant uh, Consultative Committee on uh, Animal Nutritional Needs. So we see here that, for example, a ram at maintenance requirements can eat around about a bit over one and a half to two percent of their body weight a day. So if you've got a hundred kilogram ram, for example, um, that means they're going to need about, uh, let's say about uh, 1.7 kilos of dry matter a day. And if they can consume uh, eight megajoules or 1.7 times eight, which is going to be about, um, what was that, about 12 megajoules, um, 
to be able to meet their daily requirements. They need a crude protein, just under 8%. And we won't talk about the fibre requirements or calcium and phosphorus at this stage, but that's if we want to get delve into a bit more nutritional detail, we can get into that. But I'm sure um, Deb Scammer will cover all that. Uh, and we come down here, for, so for a ewe at joining, needs around about 2% of their body weight a day. And uh, as we said, around about 8 megajoule diet, 8% um, crude protein, as we talked about earlier, a lot of the pastoral species will provide that. So that's not really a problem. Uh, then we go into early pregnancy, late pregnancy, and we see here that obviously the energy requirements are going up as the uh, fetus or fetuses are developing. And of course, we need a bit more protein as well to meet the, uh, the muscle uh, requirements as those developing fetuses. And then when we get into lactation, we're needing more energy still because we're trying to meet the use energy requirements plus a lot of energy out in the milk. And uh, we're also still needing to provide that um, adequate crude protein to meet the needs of the developing fetus, um, sorry, over here. So as we say, the early born lamb needs around about 16% crude protein and then that tapers off as they get older. Uh, so for a weaner lamb, they can eat about 4% of their body weight a day. So a weaner might be 30 kilos, 4% of their body weight is gonna be four times uh, three, which is 1.2 kilos. Uh, so you need a high energy diet High energy density, so good quality feed, uh, because they'll need be, need to be eating 1.2 kilos of an 11 megajoule diet, which is you know, going to be around about 13 megajoules, uh, and that's probably a bit higher there. They don't really need 16% as a weaner. That's more as a as a newborn lamb. They probably only need about 13 to 14% crude protein, which a lot of the plant species we looked at do provide that. And of course, they need high calcium for their bone development right through here from uh, late pregnancy through to weaning stage uh, and still a you know, reasonable quantity of phosphorus as well. Whereas replacement ewe lambs, um, not quite as high energy demand, uh, but 3% of their body weight eaten daily. So if, well, if these are, it's about you know, one kilogram and uh, reasonable protein to get um, good growth but they don't need a, as high a diet because they're really only just ticking over to maintain survival. Okay, so uh, just looking back at the uh, energy and protein requirements of um, the various species we talked about. So the Acacia victoriae um, prickly wattle has got an ME around about eight, crude protein of 13. We've got the bladder salt bush, um, similar sort of feed values, the uh, cotton bush, uh, it's actually quite high in protein, similar energy, uh, button grass, uh, barley Mitchell grass, uh, stalks build geranium. So that's um, often considered a weed in some areas, but it uh, obviously has quite significant energy value and also protein value. And then we can get into some of the high energy, uh, high protein values and high energy. So the native clover and the verbene um, are quite good. Um, feed values. Now, obviously, um, even though these animals, uh, these plants are good nutritional value, of course, as they mature and, and die off, um, all these values uh, deteriorate accordingly. Now, if you, um, obviously, this is a lot to take in, so um, you can have access to this uh, PowerPoint afterwards, as Paul mentioned, so that um, you can digest this a bit, uh, over a over a cup of tea. Um, I just put this guide in here so to show that we've got the similar sort of information available for cattle. Um, I won't go into it here, but similar sort of estimates about dry matter intake, how much of their body weight they can eat each day. So if you've got a 500 kilogram cow, um, they'll be eating just under 2% of their body weight daily. So that's going to be about 10 kilograms. Um, and then that, that goes up, of course, um, uh, goes up another 50% perhaps into in lactation, not nearly as much as in sheep. And so we see correspondingly here that they only need a, a diet that's got an eight megajoules per kilogram of dry matter. But as we go into uh, late pregnancy lactation, the energy density of that diet's got to improve. So it's when you might be eating some of your, for example, native clover uh, or verbene uh, with a higher energy density, that's gonna be the best feed for these lactating animals. And, and correspondingly, it will have higher protein to meet their needs. 
Okay, so just reiterating that, I'll just go through those sums a bit more. So if you've got a 60 kilogram sheep, so we talk about 60 kilogram U is one that's um, say in score three condition uh, at maintenance. Uh, so they'll need about 10 megajoules a day. Uh, they'll be eating about 2% of their body weight a day. So 2% of 60 is 1.2. Uh, if it's a, an eight megajoule diet, so 1.2 times eight is about 9.6. So near enough to 10 megajoules, uh, they need that 8% protein uh, and they only need sort of maintenance requirements of calcium. But as we go into late pregnancy, their percentage of their body weight increases, uh, the density or the value of the feed they're on offer needs to be better to meet their rising energy needs. So they've, they've actually gone up almost 50% energy requirements in late, late pregnancy. And we see on here correspondingly because they're getting uh, the, the lambs are growing inside, so they need more protein. Plus, they're preparing milk for lactation, so that needs more protein. And they need more calcium because um, the developing bones of the fetus or fetuses. And so that's where we do need to do a supplementation, especially if they're on a grain diet. But certainly making sure you've got enough calcium in the diet. So a lot of these plant species we've looked at actually do have quite good calcium content but it is largely dependent on soil type. And then we go through into lactation. Uh, the, lamb, the lambs are on the ground, so the ewes got more opportunity to eat, so eating up to a bit over 4% of their body weight. So 4% of 60 is 2.4 kilos. We need a high energy density in the diet. We need good protein content uh, so that we can get close to meeting the uh, needs of 25 megajoules for a single lamb. Uh, or if they've got twins, we need 32 megajoules for that first um, three weeks of lactation. Just also never, and not to forget, water requirements. So if they're on a dry feed diet, they normally need around about two to four litres a day. But if there's a lot of salt in the diet, that can be uh, anything up to, um, you know, six times the amount of uh, water intake. Uh, so salt drives, obviously, thirst. Uh, and they need to eat, eat more, or should I say drink more, to uh, get rid of that excess salt in the diet. Uh, and even on a hay diet, um, any sort of dry feed diet, they'll need more water to um, deal with that high fibre diet. And uh, so we can talk about stock quality or water quality. So here we've talked about the total dissolved solids or the salts in the um, in the water, whatever, wherever it may come from, presumably from boar or perhaps dams. But we see here that uh, mature sheep are able to cope with much higher uh, salt levels in the water than, say, uh, mature cattle. But if it's a um, lambs or lactating ewes, uh, we certainly don't want to go above about 4,000 parts per million. But you can see I have it here, that's for health. But if you're just trying to get animals to survive, well, we see that you can actually have sheep on 10,000 parts per million that will survive, but they won't do that well. So um, you really got to focus on water quality if you want productivity. And so if you don't actually have, if you have poor quality for water, you're more likely to see reluctance to drink, more likely scouring, weight loss, poor health convulsions and death. Uh, so effectively it's a salt poisoning. And uh, some of the other aspects of water quality, which people don't dwell on so much, but it is, uh, can be important. So the pH, uh, normally if it's between six and a half and eight and a half, they will drink it. If it's um, got modest calcium, magnesium, nitrate, sulfur, copper iron, that's all okay. But we can see over here that if you exceed some of these benchmarks, so greater than 1,000 parts per million of, um, of calcium will create phosphorus deficiency, greater than 1,000 parts of magnesium will cause scouring, greater than 500 of nitrate, vomiting, convulsions, death, high sulfur, Similar story, uh, high copper uh, can actually cause um, liver damage and jaundice. Iron, not such a problem, but um, aluminium and moly can also be issues. But generally, they aren't commonly seen. But if you are having animals that are performing poorly, it may pay to check the water supply, just do a, a water test. Okay, so knowing the um, nutritional requirements, uh, we normally say condition scoring is the best tools that you can use because uh, it's an accurate indicator. If you check at least 25, preferably 50 sheep in a mob at random, 
uh, you can determine what sort of um, nutritional status those animals are in, what they've been eating in the past, and it gives you a good idea of how they're going to go through pregnancy. So each condition score represents about 10 kilograms of fat. So by having a condition score of three out of five, it means they've actually got an adequate amount of fat to support them through that latter stage of pregnancy. But you don't want to rely on it too much, otherwise you end up with that twin lamb disease or pregtoxemia. The advantage of condition scoring is that um, good condition scores uh, result in higher scanning lambing and weaning percentage, uh, reduced ewe mortality, uh, you end up with heavier lambs and, and also with good immunity because they're well nourished, uh, better weaning weights, they are, the ewes produce more colostrum uh, and then milk after the uh, first couple of days of colostrum and then you have animals that are better mothers so they're more likely to hang around and support their um, single or twin lambs. So there's a lot of advantages in condition scoring uh, and so this is the ideal if you can have ewes in that sort of condition at lambing well uh, that's about as good as it gets. In other words, nice rounded uh, backside. If you're feeling the lumbar, the short ribs here, and the spine here, uh, you can feel a good fat cover. So it actually feels, if you think about the palm of your hand, if you run your fingers across the palm of your hand, that's about score three and a half. Um, if you run it across the, um, just behind your knuckles, between your wrist and your knuckles, run your fingers across that, that's about a score three. So that's how, um, when you're palpating these short ribs here, it should feel like the, um, the back of your hand between your wrist, halfway between your wrist and your knuckles. That's what we're really aiming for. Uh, and so when do you condition score? Well, ideally, I mean, I appreciate that you don't get sheep in very often in pastoral country, but uh, ideally you'd be doing it pre-joining when you put the, pull the rams out, if you were preg scanning, if you were doing pre-lambing vaccinations, that sort of issue, and also weaning. So you can actually monitor, you can actually get a very good gauge of whether you're feeding the ewes enough uh, just by doing that condition scoring of around about 50 sheep uh, on a periodic basis. And then you can actually make predictions about um, the likelihood of getting good lambing percentage, good good weaning percentage, etc. Uh, or for that matter, even at a good conception rate. So this graph is really showing what we've talked about. Uh, we don't want to use in score one or two condition because they're more likely to die and obviously lose their lambs as well. If you've got them in score four condition, they're too fat and so they've probably been eating too much feed and you probably should have been running more use. Um, but yeah, around about score three is the ideal. So what we're saying here is that um, from joining at day zero, uh, you can lose a bit of condition in that first 90 days. It doesn't have a big impact on productivity, but you really would like to have them up around about score three by lambing. Uh, and then they're always going to lose a bit of condition because of the energy requirements of lactation, and especially if they've got twins. Uh, so that for that next um, 90 days, uh, they might lose a bit of condition through to weaning. Uh, and then you want them to pick back up into score three condition, uh, come back here at joining. Because if you've got score three at joining, they'll have good ovulation rates. So you're optimising your chance for twinning, which is the only way you're going to get more lambs, apart from obviously getting your singles to survive. And ideally, um, you want you used to be on you know, a fairly high quality diet through that early mid lactation phase. Otherwise, the milk production is going to go down. The lambs won't have as, as good a survival chance. Managing to optimise health. So just finishing off here, health and welfare. Now, we actually collect a lot of data at the abattoirs at uh, Thomas Foods, TFI. Uh, and... Uh, this information is published each year by Prime Industries, collected by Prime Industries, and feedback data sheets are sent back to producers. So hopefully you will have all seen those. So I've just pulled out the figures for last year, or 2019, should I say, for the northern pastoral areas, uh, just to give you some idea of the information that's available. Uh, so I'll just finish up on this. So, for example, um, we can have a look at the percentage of producers who can sign affected stock in the case of lambs or mutton, and then the average percentage affected with inlines uh, across the state. So we see here that grass seeds can be quite a big issue in lambs and mutton across the state, but certainly not from the pastoral area, and certainly in 2019 anyway. Arthritis can be a significant issue in lambs and more so in mutton. So obviously, um, you know, this, this is indicating that over half of producers that send adult sheep to slaughter They've got evidence of arthritis, 
and it can be in the order of around about um, you know, seven to ten percent per line, seven percent in lambs and ten percent in or eleven percent in mutton. So half the producers from the northern region are sending in sheep that have got arthritis, and on average, it's about um, one in ten sheep in a line will have um, arthritis. Similarly, here with um, whoops, uh, I should indicate the um, the indications over here. So windmill indicates that it has a significant impact on farm. And the meat cleaver means it has a significant impact for the processor in terms of their profitability. So grass seeds and arthritis affect the producer as well as the abattoir. Sheep measles is mainly an impact on the abattoir. Uh, sheep measles are a dog parasite, um, which is an immature stage in sheep. So we see here it's quite prevalent in 60% uh, of producers sending lines of sheep with sheep measles. And it shows up as little... Um, white cysts in the meat and uh, can be a, a significant problem for the processor but you don't tend to get docked for that or discounted as a producer. Uh, it's a relatively low incidence across the state but obviously it can be a problem in adult sheep from the northern zone. Pleurisy, um, some impact on the producer but a bigger impact on the abattoir. And so this is chronic, effectively the outcomes of chronic pneumonia where you get the lungs become attached to the, the rib cage. So it restricts the animal's ability to breathe and, and, and basically do properly. So high prevalence yeah, in lines of adult sheep. Um, but once again, probably only about one in 10 or 11 sheep per line affected. Uh, and so once again, that, that's obviously these animals that have got pleurisy are not going to perform very well and they're usually the ones that drop down and, and uh, fall over when you start pushing them from one paddock to the next. That's usually because they've got a pneumonia or pleurisy. The last one here is cheesy gland. So the good old uh, abscess uh, in around the neck or um, various parts of the body where you've got a, a lymph node. And we see very low incidence in lambs, but once again, quite high in mutton. And uh, so this is, is really related back to if animals, if lambs are getting two vaccines four to six weeks apart as a lamb, uh, you'll have a pretty low incidence of cheesy gland. But if they're not getting that first or second vaccination, um, you're going to have a significant in incidence in adults. And so this is actually a bigger problem in pastoral areas than anywhere else where probably sheep are less likely to get two vaccines. And uh, the last slide here on feedback. So we look at um, there can be lesions associated with vaccination, obviously not a significant issue in pastoral areas, but can be across the state. Pneumonia uh, can be a bit of an issue. Rib fractures, not really a big issue. Bruising can be a problem. There's probably this is more related to transport over long distances. Uh, kidney damage, uh, sometimes this can be toxic plant species or sometimes parasites. And uh, cirrhosis is a chronic liver damage, which may be once again associated normally with probably toxic plants. And the last one here is bladder worm, which is um, another tapeworm in adult dogs. Uh, it's a, and it's just a bladder cyst in the carcass in sheep. So high prevalence, low, low issue to um, you as a producer, but ideally, same as with the um, sheep measles, ideally if you're treating your dogs every um, four to six weeks with tapeworm or worming tablets, um, that prevents this from being spread, although obviously foxes can still be an issue and wild dogs. Okay, so in summary, um, we really need to get the management system right and part of that is actually uh, having a good grazing management pro practice so that you're ensuring that you're not eating paddocks out that they're getting access to the preferred species so the animals will um, perform well. Uh, and then knowing what the nutritional targets are that we've sort of discussed, and then monitoring using condition scoring, for example, to assess how much if the animals are getting adequate feed intake. Uh, ideally, treating or use with twins better so that you get better survival rates. That's how you're going to get a, a higher lambing percentage. Uh, and the important thing here is that it's not these um, to getting it right, it doesn't necessarily require a, a lot of expenditure. It's more a case of um, just making good decisions by using your monitoring tools. Okay, I've probably spoken for long enough. Um, 
I didn't draw a breath. I didn't get any questions, but uh, happy to answer any questions if you've got any. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Back to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Colin. That was really good. It really shows how complicated it could really be to maintain the condition of your sheep during the dry times when you've got to take all these factors into account. But um, does anyone have any questions? Well, while, while people are thinking of a question, I'll just, so everyone wants a healthy flock and they really want to maximize the vegetation on their property. So to ensure you're providing the right level of nutrition to your sheep, how do you decide when you're going to move your stock from one paddock to or one area to the next? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. And it's probably one of the things uh, we, we run lifetime ewe management groups. Uh, in fact, I'm heading to Tas uh, Tasmania, Ash <laughs> Kicker Island um, tomorrow because um, I've got a sheep producer group just started down there, a bunch of young producers. And we look at monitoring stock every time we meet. We meet about every six or eight weeks. Uh, so we monitor 50 ewes on each property. And then we look at the uh, feed on offer in the paddock and we do a feed budget. In other words, is there enough energy in this paddock to meet these animals' needs at this stage of their reproductive cycle, whether they're pregnant or lactating or whatever? Uh, and so as the uh, table I've shown you, that varies throughout the season and the reproductive cycle. And uh, so if you've got a, a monoculture, you know, for example, say a, I don't know, a, a wheat crop or a wheat stubble or something, it's pretty simple. You can actually say, oh, well, this is, this is the feed on offer. Uh, we can estimate what the value of that feed is. We've checked the ewe condition score. We know what they need because they're mid-pregnancy or whatever. Uh, and so it's a very simple sum. But obviously in pastoral areas, uh, far more complicated because there's a much greater diversity of feed on offer. So whether it's some um, you know, native grasses or forbs or uh, perennials, shrubs, uh, etc., cetera, um, you've got to be able to predict what the animals are likely to be eating. And so that um, slide we put up earlier of the preferred species that plant, uh, animals will eat, you use them as an indicator species. So, for example, if um, if if you've got uh, native clovers present um, you know, and they've been eaten now, or if you've got, um, you know, for example, some prickly wattle uh, or Mitchell grass, etc., if that's uh, been eaten out, well, you know that the country is... Um, probably uh, the nutritive value of what's on offer is uh, deteriorating. And so you really need to look at to moving those animals to another uh, ungrazed area. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's really obviously comes with a lot of know-how in pastoral country. But effectively, uh, the way is to use some uh, indicator species, the ones that you know are more palatable, uh, and also knowing the stage of their growth so that if they... Um, you know, if there's still plenty of your colourable species there where you know the animals should be getting enough to meet their needs. And of course, if you are, are able to yard them and fill their, their back fat, their um, condition score, uh, that's a pretty good indicator. But if they're starting to lose condition, they're looking a bit poorly, um, obviously it's a good idea to move them on because you don't want to overgraze your, your better species because that means um, often that country, especially in pastoral country, will take years to come back. I mean, they talk about how um, overgrazing in the 1890s up the... Um, you know, the Yanta line um, is still evident today because if you do overgraze a lot, especially your um, perennial shrubs and herbs, um, yeah, often they can take decades to uh, return. Sorry, not, not a straightforward answer, but that's the uh, best I can do. <laughs> We've got two questions from Matthew. He's asked, when is the best time of the year to drench use for worms? And when is the most important time during pregnancy to improve lamb wool production? Good, two good questions. Now, on a worm basis, um, actually, when I first uh, went to Port Augusta in 1980, I remember going out investigating uh, sheep deaths um, out um, towards the Gula Ranges, and it was just because they'd had about like, a 30 mil of rain, uh, and about two or three weeks later, sheep start dying. So typically, um, even in pastoral country, sheep can carry worms, but often that's just a background level, which actually maintains a certain degree of immunity uh, and not a problem. So we actually these days we never advocate drenching unless um, they're becoming an issue. Now on the inside country, what I do is get sheep to, sorry, producers to send in say 20 dungs from a, a mob of sheep that you might have had in the yards. You can actually post them in. Uh, I can give you an address of someone to send them to. It costs about $25 to get a dung a worm egg count done on on 20 sheep, and uh, if that's 
less than 100, we say, look, don't worry about it, not a problem. If it's you know, several hundred worm eggs per gram of feces, well, then we say, okay, they do need a drench. But I think the biggest issue in um, the pastoral country is more when you've had a you know, thunderstorm and you've actually had 20 plus mil of rain. Um, that's when worms may become an issue in the ensuing weeks. And so that's probably when you might consider doing a worm drench or otherwise, yeah, if it was feasible to send post off a um, 20 domes, you need to get them to the lab within about two or three days, which is a bit difficult with a the post these days. Um, but uh, in fact, I'm not even sure if the um, vet practices in Port Augusta, for example, may actually do worm egg counting themselves. But um, that's that's really the ideal. If you've had you know, a major rainfall, um, you might consider giving them a worm drench about um, you know, two or three weeks after that rainfall if you've had a significant green feed germination because that basically encourages um, sheep to graze more closely uh, and they're more likely to pick up worms uh, and encourage encourages the worms to do better. From a um, what stage does uh, nutrition impact on wool production? So as I said, the first 90 days, the first three months of pregnancy uh, is when primary follicle development is occurring in the fetus. And uh, so that really doesn't have much impact on wool production, but it's the last 60 days. So from day 90 to day 150, in other words, lambing, so that period is when you're getting a secondary wool follicle development in the skin. And that's the one that's critical for lifetime wool production. So we want to ideally have high density of secondary wool follicles in the skin. So if those lambs or lamb or lambs are uh, it, during that last 60 days of pregnancy, if they are compromised, in other words, the ewe is not being fed well enough, so she might be losing condition, say going from three back to two condition score, the lambs are going to be undernourished. And what happens then is you actually lose a lot of the density of the wool follicles. And so those lambs, if they do survive through to birth and beyond, uh, they're going to have a reduced uh, lifetime wool production because they'll have a poor follicle density. Uh, and it can also impact on the uh, micron. So they might actually end up having a stronger micron because of the um, low follicle density. So it's a bit of a double whammy. They'll have lower wool cuts and stronger wool. So it's really critical that you actually feed ewes well in the last uh, two months of pregnancy. Um, so just in regards to the, um, the drenching, so if with the, I guess, Lenina and we've got big rains coming and a bit of monsoonals up north. Would you say wait until it slows down the northern, um, the rains stop coming down? So say March, April, May, it slows down a little. Would you say it's worth getting checks throughout the period just to see if the worm levels rise? Uh, yes, uh, and I guess the other issue is and a lot of producers across the state um, in both low, medium and high rainfall areas do tend to uh, drench use pre lambing. So, as I've said, we don't really want to yard use in the last four weeks of pregnancy, but in the last um, one to two months or two months out from pregnancy, if you were to give them a worm drench, then it just means the ewes are being cleaned out. Uh, and so it means that they're not going to be shedding a lot of worm, worm eggs on the pasture when they've got young lambs on them. So, um, if you're going to drench a ewe at all, I'd be suggesting that you tend to do it. Uh, pre-lambing, but if um, you know if it's remained dry, um, you're probably not going to get much transmission of worms anyway. The other critical thing is that when you're weaning lambs, we always say that you should always give lambs at weaning a worm drench because you just don't want any anything that's going to hold them back, and so you don't want them competing with a gut full of worms. And it's also young lambs or weaners don't have any immunity. Whereas adult sheep, if they've been exposed to worms, um, they will actually have a certain degree of immunity against worms, but weaners haven't got any immunity. And so if they get a worm burden, they will fall on a heap. So probably ideally you would always give weaners a drench out weaning, um, even though they may not actually have a significant worm egg count, but uh, the other time would be um, yeah, potentially pre-lambing. So say um, four to six weeks before lambing. Um, so Ian's got a question. He's said some sheep breeds are promoted as being able to lamb three times in two years. Given the timing of veg and new condition, does this negate this promoted benefit? 
Yeah, look, certainly it's not a common practice, but some some people do do that. Uh, and the critical thing there is um, you're effectively putting the rams back in with the ewes um, almost straight after lambing. Uh, and so if the ewes are in good enough condition, uh, once again, they need to be around about, you know, two and a half, preferably three score um, out on a, score, out on a scale of five. If they're in good enough condition, they will actually get back in lamb, you know, in during lactation. Uh, and that's the way you do get um, three lambings in two years. But of course, if they uh, were struggling to keep in condition at lambing and then they um, are going to lose some condition at, at during lactation anyway, the chances of getting back in lamb is pretty minimal. So it would really depend a lot on, yeah, the feed on offer, the quality of the feed on offer um, in that post lambing period as to whether you can actually get them back in lamb. So yeah, look, it, it can be done, but it does require some pretty good management. The only time I've, well, when I was based down the southeast, uh, there were a number of producers down there used to do that, and certainly some breeds are more capable. So for example, your your Dameras and Dorpers, uh, your shedding breeds are probably more able to do that because they tend to be a bit more um, efficient in their um, conversion of um, feed into energy uh, than say your average Merino. Um, so it's, it's a possibility, but yeah, it requires pretty good management.